Hi, I'm Kelly Vaughn and welcome to Inside Indy. Uh, if you've been watching the local news, you've probably heard about the uh, hate crime legislation that had been pending over at the State House. And uh, so we want to let you know more about that, the outcome for this, the outcome of it for this year. Uh, and beyond, and here in the studio to kind of give us some insight is Pastor John Gerton Jr. of Christ Missionary Baptist Church. Welcome to Inside India. I swear I almost forgot your name. <laughs> I've only been knowing you like for more than a decade. So right, right. Sorry about right. that. I just kind of had a momental. <laughs> no, no, I understand. I forget my name sometimes too. Oh, and then I know I'm all right. So how are you, Pastor Gerton? I'm doing, I'm doing quite well. Okay. It's good to be here with you. Okay. Now, I, I see a lot of... Uh, Facebook, you are quite the activist, uh, mm. I might add. Um, and I want to go back a little bit uh, as far as your roots. Um, what, a couple of years ago, even on the corner of Dr. King's Tree, was that 27th and Dr. 2015, King? 2015, on the corner of 30th and MLK, okay, between 29th and 30th and Martin Luther King. Okay, and you did the, uh, the, the tent situation where you were living on the under the tent for 30 days at a time, mm -hmm. and you could actually get a feel of what was going on in the community, in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. whether it be from hearing gunshots to people coming together to uh, kind of come to... whatever. It was a lot. It was way more than I think people give these communities credit for representing in their community. It was way more going on than just shootings and, mm -hmm. and you know, violence and uh, DV, domestic violence. It was way more going on. It was a lot of, much of it was positive mm. that I found. Right, and that was what was so cool about it was like uh, the chance for um, those issues to be addressed about by people who were seeing it mm -hmm. uh, unfold, whether on television or actually coming by to see it, to say, hey, how can I help? And so mm -hmm. when do you get an opportunity for those two to come together? Right. Ideally, they should be coming together in, in the church, and here you are in mm -hmm. this tent, mm -hmm. a church of sorts, I guess, on the mm -hmm. corner. Of, uh, well, and every church's mandate is to, is to go outside of the four walls and to walk out uh, as the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of Christ. Every church has that mandate that's open in the name of Jesus Christ. Should be leaving that church on a Sunday after getting filled up with the word or after uh, having received instruction from the word, or guidance from the word or whatever that, that, the, you know, that the word of God is giving them. They should leave that church and then go out in that community and make an impact for the kingdom. And so the tent really represented sort of that, uh, that extension uh, that we mm -hmm. had in the church. And oftentimes people would, who, who experienced the tent um, would make their way to the church. But we would recognize that often, even, even to this day, I think a lot of people recognize that uh, the presenting issue that people have in communities mm -hmm. uh, is just that. It's a presenting issue. And the tent gave us a chance to not just get to the presenting issue, oh, I'm hungry, oh, I'm cold, oh, I need some place to stay, oh, I'm dealing with some type of violence, oh, I've got a mental health issue or whatever. Uh, those might be presenting issues, but the longer you develop a relationship with individuals, you begin to talk to them, you, be, you, can, you can get beyond the presenting issue to get to some of the, the more deep-seated uh, challenges that people have. And I think mm. that's the real goal is, is, yes, we want to feed those that are hungry. Yes, we want to clothe those that are naked. Yes, we want to uh, support those uh, who have been widowed, those who are fatherless. Yes, we want to support them because that's the presenting issue. But oftentimes, there's more to it than just that. Mm. There are some other lingering things that we need to deal with. And uh, uh, a majority of those have some type of spiritual connection mm. uh, that that really uh, uh, I think is the root of a lot of dysfunction in our community that we will not deal with. Okay, and mm. that probably and as we talk more about legislation, I think uh, you'll find that our desire to be an advocate, even in that arena, uh, gives way to us dealing with the spiritual side of some of the decisions that are coming out of the House and the Senate. Um, so it's not just a decision. It's a decision that's rooted in something deeper than the facts. Because when, even when you lay the facts out, sometimes it makes you scratch your head when you see the direction that people vote. And you wonder, what is that about? And, and that could be tied mm. to a spiritual issue and not even rational, logical um, um, information. Mm -hmm. So let's take it from the tent to the House and Senate over at the State House. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, the hate crime legislation. Mm -hmm. Tell us what it was, and then we'll get into the outcome because we're past it this legislative session, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Basically, um, all the 
the hate crime, and I'm not a legislator or an attorney or a lobbyist. I'm just going to give but it to you the way. Yeah, there. I'm going to give it to you the way uh, I was able to translate it to the community that I advocate for. And so basically, uh, the uh, bias motivated crimes bill or hate motivated crimes bill uh, was designed uh, to give those who have been charged or uh, who have committed allegedly a crime, uh, it gives those courts the ability to enhance the sentence or to increase the sentence based on the fact that their, their, that, that crime was committed based on uh, a, a sense that this person or the property of that person uh, was uh, a member of a, a, a class or, or a, a person that was either a certain race or creed or color or background or gender or gender identity or uh, national origin, age or sex. Uh, and so uh, the way we looked at that is, is that these are immutable characteristics. In other words, there are characteristics that that individual can't help. These are characteristics mm -hmm. that that uh, individual uh, oftentimes is just perceived. Uh, so it may mm -hmm. not be that that I'm Jewish, but if I look Jewish and, and someone uh, perpetrates a crime against me just because they think I'm Jew Jewish, because I may look, or if uh, I say I'm a fair-skinned person, I'm not necessarily African-American, I could be Hispanic, I could be Mexican, I could be Latino, but if someone sees that and they uh, they in some way think that you are a part of a group and they perpetrate a crime against you based on that perceived characteristic, mm -hmm. then that court has the ability based on those facts to enhance that sentence. Uh, okay. And that's the fundamental of the hate, uh, hate motivated. So it's just toughen, uh, toughening up the sentencing yeah, on, basically. on hate crime. Could you give us an example of, do you know of some known cases of, of hate crimes here in Indianapolis that, that oh. stick out? Well, okay, I know you asked for Indianapolis, but we're gonna, let's just go back real quick to at least two cases. I can't remember the exact names, but I think it was a bird. Uh, it was one of the cases where uh, you had a case of an African-American, I believe it was in Texas, who, who had, had been targeted and was like chained behind a truck by some white uh, nationalists or white supremacists or whatever, and they drug him um, several, uh, several feet or whatever, and it's, it was decapitated and all. It was just a horrendous crime. That was one of the turning points in this whole debate about hate crimes legislation. Another was a young man who identified with the, uh, with, uh, the gay community who had been targeted. And he also suffered a horrendous uh, crime and was left outside on, on a fence or something like that. It was, a, yeah, it was just case. horrible. Mm -hmm. And so those were two, two cases that are kind of pivotal that a lot of people bring up uh, when we're talking about hate-motivated crime. Here in Indiana, obviously the one crime uh, that really got our governor involved was when there was a swastika that was painted on a synagogue in Carmel. And uh, because of that, that kind of raised the, um, the attention of hate motivated crime here in uh, the state of Indiana. That is not the only uh, hate crime uh, that has happened in Indiana. I, uh, uh, I don't have any, uh, I have no uh, reservations at all pointing back to the 1913 lynching of two, those two African American 19 year old boys. Uh, in uh, Marion, Indiana. I have no yeah. problem whatsoever pointing back. That was a hate crime. Yeah, yeah. Um, and very famous picture. Yeah, very famous picture. In fact, picture. I've actually met the niece of one of the Correct. gentlemen and I've been trying to get her in on the show mm -hmm. to talk about it. And and yeah. to be quite frank, uh, my, uh, uh, one of my best friend, uh, his father is named after one of the young men that was hanging from that tree, mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Shipp. And I actually reached out to him and, and uh, when we were in the middle of this hate crimes piece and I said, I said, uh, Brad Ship, I said, Brad, is uh, this Thomas Ship who's, who was lynched in 1913, is that a family member of yours? Because they were from Richmond. And uh, his wife reached back and said, yeah, that's, her, that, that's his father's first cousin. Wow. And so I kind of brought it home for me. Uh, there's others, Lyle Station, like, Yeah, because like in that history book, it looks yeah, it like looks, it was a long time ago. It wasn't that far. Yeah, and, 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 we, and we can look at that existentially, like, oh, that's 
you know, that's not Indiana, that's down south someplace. And right. it's like, no, it's right here. And it was just as much, to me, it's just as much hate then as it is today when someone is targeted based on uh, a characteristics that for us, we know mm -hmm. we can't change this. Right. Uh, and so we have to carry that burden of feeling like we're targeted by people who it's not about anything we've done or anything that we've said, but it's just because of a bias on had. They don't even know us and they're trying to send a message to an entire people group. And so what was the outcome this year? Oh and, Lord, and, it, was, yeah. okay. it went back and forth. It went back and, and forth. And we've got just about three or four minutes left. So I, I want to hit those key points in terms of what they, what, what was the outcome? Do, do we have new legislation? Yes. Yeah. The governor did sign uh, the hate crime, the hate motivated crimes legislation in the law. I believe it was April the 3rd. Uh, and uh, that means it's on the books. The challenge is, is that what we were fighting for or advocating for was a crime bill that had teeth, that it had the characteristics actually listed in the bill. Um, the Senate uh, originally, when we went in, I believe in February and had a Senate hearing, uh, I was one of those that testified at the hearing. Uh, the hearing lasted about 90 minutes or so. Uh, we were able to advocate getting those characteristics put back in the bill after they were stripped out. Those, those uh, I guess 10, 11, 12 char characteristics that I mentioned That you earlier. mentioned from the beginning. Correct. Okay. Uh, we were able, they, were, they were stripped out. We were able to get them back in. Uh, the, the hearing happened. Uh, and then after the hearing, uh, the actual bill came out of the Senate committee, which was sort of a yay, uh, it came out. But then 48 hours, uh, the supermajority kind of came in and stripped the bill of those characteristics again. Uh, and then it became what we one, some could argue is uh, unenforceable and unconstitutional at that point. The bill was so watered down that there was very, virtually nothing really that it could really do. So once it got over to the, the House, of course, our goal was to get those characteristics back in. Well, we succeeded in getting the majority of the characteristics, characteristics back in, but it did not include gender, gender identity, or age, all right? Which, of course, gender is representing roughly 51% of the Indiana population. So that means any uh, male or any female that is targeted based on their gender is not protected under this bill. So while we're excited that we got a bill signed into law. We're not excited because it is not all inclusive, nor is it comprehensive. And so that's kind of where we are right now. Okay. And very quickly, what was the motive for, what, what is the motive of stripping that? And I'm sure you've had conversations with both sides. On the, on the other side, what was the motive for taking it out? Well, the, the, the best that I can say is that the motive was that um, we have struggled in the state of Indiana to deal with the word gender whether it's gender identity or just gender in general. We've struggled with that word because we're, uh, there are some in the House and the Senate who have challenges with the LGBTQ community. And what do we do and how do we, and their challenges are coming from a faith perspective as best I can tell. Um, and, and you know, I would love to, to take time to really talk that out personally okay. as a man of faith, uh, because I, I, I see what my, what my Bible says with regard to the Good Samaritan, that the Good Samaritan stopped and helped uh, someone who, um, from a society perspective, they did not get along with. Um, uh, the, and so mm. I feel as though if you've, everyone has a human right uh, to, to know that they can live and walk and exist in a space and not be targeted because of an immutable characteristics of, that they have that they can't change. Okay. But that seems to be Well, we're going to have to have challenge. you back for part two. You might <laughs> come back up next time because I do want Anytime. to finish this conversation. We just ran out of time. But Anytime. I just did want to add to that that it's interesting that, um, and, and I'm not speaking for or against, but I do believe that if they're looking at certain things as being a sin, mm -hmm. I don't understand why we're not focusing on things like adultery. Correct. You know, because yeah. there, it, there's probably a lot more of people that do that than are whatever else they're. <laughs> it's yeah. like I never hear anything about that, but that's okay. Yeah, anyway, you yeah. know, and I, the, the yeah. characterizing sin is going to always be a challenge and it'll be a problem to say this is a this is an okay sin and that is not. And, right. Yeah. And, and, and at the end of the sins, day, right. sin or sin or no, people are human, right. and at some point we have to recognize the humanity of individuals okay. and recognize okay. they shouldn't be bashed in the head because of whatever they they're doing. Right. So, okay. Well, we appreciate you coming in. I, real quickly, you have a 100th anniversary, Christ Missionary Baptist Church. Yes. You've got a year-long 
yeah, stuff coming we're, up. Yeah, we're celebrating even right now. Okay. And, but our, our main celebration is August the 11th through the 18th uh, of this year. We've got a week's long of activities, and so we'll be back to talk about uh, the speakers that are coming in, uh, okay. Maurice Watson, E. Dewey we'll do Smith, right. and Bishop uh, Paul Morton. Okay. So John Gurton, Jr., Christ mm -hmm. Missionary Baptist Church. Thanks so much for joining us. Bless you. On Inside Indy, and we'll be back with more here. We've got some actors and singers coming in here oh, on Lord. Inside Indy next. Forget, how can you forget that? That performance, awesome. <laughs> Man, to talk about the talent, the energy. Oh, you're, you're very kind. No, Thank you're very you. good. <laughs> <laughs> and she is Cynthia Collins with the Actors Theater of Indiana. You yes. are the founder. Yes, I'm one of the co-founders along with Don Farrell and mm -hmm. Judy Fitzgerald who are also in this production of Forbidden Broadway. Forbidden Broadway. Yes. Yes. I do want to talk about Actors Theater of Indiana, sure. but let's talk about Forbidden Broadway. Yeah. What people can expect when they come to see you uh, and the others perform. This is a, a spoof on uh, Broadway musicals, okay? So you'll probably see about 28 musicals in one night. And of course we just saw. And you just saw Annie, Annie right? A spoof on Annie, of course. She's a little older. <laughs> Call me Anne. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the Scotch and a Virginia Slims. There you um, go. But yeah, it's it's that what you just saw is is just the tip of the iceberg. This show is absolutely a wild ride through all the great icons and great musicals of musical theater history, ah. and uh, and it's kind of like Saturday Saturday Night Live meets musical theater. It's oh, okay. it's just it's just insane. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, like I said, it's a crazy ride. So mm -hmm. you'll see like Annie, you'll see Carol Channing, you'll see uh, a spoof from Les Mis, Cats, Lion King, Wicked, The Little Mermaid. And it uh, evolves you know, then every time. It does. Right. Uh, this, the history of this show is Gerard Alessandrini, the creator of Forbidden Broadway, mm -hmm. started this 20, probably about 27 years ago now in the city. When I say the city, I mean New York City. And with every new Broadway season, the show changed. So the, the amount of material over the past 27 years is, is just unbelievable. Right, yeah. um, so we update our productions. This is, I believe, about the fourth time we've done Forbidden Broadway oh, in no. our okay. history. Okay. So my very good friend, Billy Kimmel, who was in the show in New York, um, directs it for us. Nice, so we're very nice. lucky to have him because he brings all the new material with him, okay. and we okay. say, well, what do we want to do? What do we want to add? You know, uh -huh. what new material do we want to put in? And uh, like in this latest version we're doing, Book of Mormon, Little Mermaid, mm -hmm. um, uh, Miss Saigon. Okay. You know, those are some okay. of the new ones we're adding in. But um, it just evolved. It evolved with every new Broadway season. Okay. So we try to do that with our production too. Now, with you doing the production in Indianapolis, and say there's somebody in Cincinnati doing the same thing, do they add on different shows? So say for example, 
someone is doing a production of Forbidden Broadway somewhere else, okay? Mm -hmm. um, they will not be doing the same production we're doing because we are lucky enough, because of my friend Billy Kimmel, who directs the show for us, because he did it in the city, um, we have carte blanche with the material we can get. Nice. So, because he knows everyone. So he just asks, listen, I'm going out to direct this at Actors Theatre of Indiana again, and we're gonna be doing this material. Thank goodness we're very lucky that the rights and royalty people say, yes, absolutely, because, because they know him, and, okay. and it's, it, they trust him. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's really wonderful, so we can change the show, and we can, the show, our show can evolve as well, okay. just like the original. This sounds like it's gonna be a, a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> yes, it's madness. Yeah. But it yeah. is fun for us, because yeah. we get to play, you know, you get to play all these icons, like Carol Channing and, and Patti Lapone and uh, Ethel Merman. Ethel's not in this mm -hmm. one, but, mm -hmm. and Liza Minnelli's not in this one, but you get to play all those people. And, and you have to, we're, we're imitating them. So, yeah, so that's no, we're imitating ask, are them. Are you playing you? Doing we're imitating them. Imitating no, we are them imitating them. them. And it's a spoof. So you're not actually, there's a difference between imitating a person and actually playing a person. We are imitating. It's okay. a spoof. It's funny. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but you're going to know exactly who that person is. You know. Now that's a gift in and of itself to be able. It's to very imitate difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. People. And and Judy Fitzgerald, uh, my my cohort, is really really good at it. She can. In our last production, she did Barbara Streisand. She does a great Barbara Streisand. She's actually doing Patti Lapone. In this production, she's she's also doing Bernadette Peters in this production. Um, Don Farrell actually does Carol Channing. Yeah. He does Carol because okay. he does the best Carol Channing. So that's what he does. Okay, <laughs> that's what okay. he does. But um, yeah, it's it it is difficult. And but there's tricks. There's there's little mm -hmm. tricks. I did Julie Andrews in our last production. So there's little tricks. Ooh, and you you mm -hmm. did you you know there's there's little tricks vocally. So that you, you learn to do. Do you have to study that person, obviously? Do yeah, you? But, you, but what's easier to study, actually, and you do study that person. Yes, you do listen to that person. But it is also helpful to study the people who did it in Forbidden Broadway. Yeah. And, and the, the ones who are really good, at, really good at imitating them. It's good to study them, too. Sometimes it's a little easier to get it that way. Yeah. What inspired you to create Actors Theater of Indiana? Uh, well, the three of us met in New York City. We were all working, actors as we still are, but, and then we started um, doing shows together. What, that does happen. You know, we just met doing uh, different regional productions together, different regional theaters, and then a theater down in Atlanta called Georgia Ensemble Theater mm -hmm. hired all three of us, and they kept hiring us every spring because every spring they do a musical. So we would go down and we would do the musical for them. So we kind of started to get a little thing going there, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. And then we were like, hmm, maybe we can do this. As crazy as that sounds. And sometimes but I think, not? sometimes I think, my God, we are crazy <laughs> to do this, to take this on. But that's, that's really how it did begin. And, and George Ensemble mentored us. They helped us out, you know? Uh, and then it was just trial by error. I mean, you just dive in and you just make, make mistakes and, you know, you just, you just, do the best you can and you, you learn from your mistakes and here we are 14, this is our 14th season, 14 wow. years later. Um, but, but the reason why we picked uh, Indiana is because Judy Fitzgerald is a native of Indiana. Uh -huh. So um, she, wanted to, she wanted to come home here and there was a need for professional theater here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're only one of four professional theater companies in the Indianapolis, central Indiana area. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So and and so good to have someone with experience, having you know been in New York and then right. down in Georgia. Yeah. Because yeah, and we've we've worked everywhere, and we've worked internationally and nationally, and we've run the gamut of uh, types of contracts we've done within our union, and mm -hmm. we've really, we've really, we really. I don't want to brag, but we've done a lot. Yeah, that's you know? okay. Hey, say it. It so, is what it is. Yeah. That's and uh, so so we're we're proud of you know being an actor, we're proud of our union, Actors Equity Association. And, um, we're, and we're proud, of course, of what we're doing here, what okay. we're bringing. I love it. I love it. Now, on the Forbidden Broadway show, let's talk about the details, dates, oh, times, yes. location, and all that good stuff. We uh, run April 
we just opened. We opened April 26th. We run till May 19th. We are at the Studio Theater at the Center for the Performing Arts in Carmel. Cool. Uh, you can get tickets uh, at the box office, 317-843-3800, or visit our website, atistage.org. That's atistage.org. You can get tickets there. Every Wednesday night, $25 tickets. Wow. I know. Good, Hello. Good, good, good. Right? I love it. Yeah. I love it. I like. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Oh, my in, God. Thanks again, Annie. Honestly. Yes. And you can call me anything. I'll answer to anything. <laughs> that was truly great. I appreciate that so much oh, for coming you. in thank and you. sharing. So will you come back? When, when is the next production uh, The next production. This is our last production of the season. Okay. So our 2019-20 season begins in September. We run our seasons run September to May. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you so come back then? if you want us back, we will be back here. Okay. We appreciate it so I, much. I love having you, Cynthia uh, Collins. Likewise, thank, thanks, Kelly. Thanks so much for joining yeah. us yeah, thanks. on Inside Indy, and thank you for joining us on Inside Indy. I'm Kelly Vaughn. We'll see you next time. Adios. <laughs> <laughs>